for sure. I know locked in. Uh, if I lock it right, so nobody is there right now. Oh, only two minutes. So I just, I just check the chat. Okay. Hey, hi Sadish. Hey, hi Sadish. Hey. Hey, Rishi. Uh, okay. Oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, I need yes. to put on this. Uh, no, it is. Uh, you're good. We can hear you. We can hear you. Can you make it full screen, Sadish? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Sadish, I have never, never done a talk on Zoom, so I just need to click the share screen and. For example, you can do a couple of things, Rishi. Are you going to use slides? Uh, I'm going to use this um, vacuum pad. Very good. Okay. So then you choose the whiteboard. Whiteboard? No, so I yeah. have a. So I can. I can no, I will share this my vacuum pad screen. That's yeah, yeah. Nice. So in the share screen, it should write somewhere white screen. Yeah. Okay. You are sharing this. I see it. Okay. But you want to write on it, right? You yes. want to be able to write on it. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Thank so it's writing. Yeah. Okay. Rishi, this might be hard to read. Uh, so maybe you have to read it out, uh, out loud. No, I can read your handwriting, but not the typed stuff. Uh, okay. What? Prachi is saying is that whatever is typed on the screen. Yes, yes, yes. Is okay. if, I mean, we can read it, but it might be a little okay, hard. Okay, okay. Okay. Uh, maybe it is just us because we are trying to look it on the TV monitor. Uh, uh, yeah, is... just a minute. I think if one is looking at it from the uh, okay, let me let me do one thing. Oh, I cannot. Uh... Uh, how do I? I want to select. Somehow it doesn't allow. See, another trouble is that I generally use Linux, and uh, oh yeah, I could do that. Uh, I mean, my uh, I'm right now in my Windows. This thing, my Linux partition had an issue, and even my other Wacom tablet, which I'm using, also had an. I mean, some issues. I'm using another Wacom tablet, which pen is very. <laughs> it's not. Uh, but let me see, for example, now, is it readable now? You might be able to. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Okay, I think other than this, uh, just a couple of other things I'm mostly going to write. So hopefully it should be fine. Yeah. Yeah, now it's We have Shinjul with us. He's a, a engineering, uh, mechanical engineering final year. He just finished his exam. Okay, he has come okay. home. So he heard about right. Spitz and uh, sitting this. Yeah. I so see, that I is see. Rishi. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Oh yeah. Hi, Kaushal. Is Kaushal there? She logged in. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Kaushal is here. Hi everyone. Hey, Kaushal. How are you? Yeah. How did the hospital visit go? Oh, you mean uh, Bihar? Rahman and Bihar. Bihar. Yeah, Right, right. It it was smooth, yeah. So now he's without. Yes. The uh, right. master. Okay. Right, right, and the p the pins are also removed. Okay, okay. Perfect. How are you, Prachi? Doing good. <laughs> it's fun. 
vegan Kerala during the monsoon season. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It must be very beautiful. Yeah. So who is with Vihan and Rohan now? Uh, our babysitter. <laughs> Okay, okay, okay. Nice. Yeah. Okay. okay, nice. Yeah. AP French. So, Rishi, have you given this talk in some form before uh, or? Uh, okay, yeah, in some form. Okay, actually, so my uh, first year course in uh, uh, mechanics, oscillations and waves, uh, I typically try and uh, my, the first lecture is typically a critical appraisal of Newton's laws. Uh, so this will be more or less along uh, those lines. I was hoping to capture more things, but then of course, you know, um, I have to wind things off in about 50 minutes to an hour, then uh, it becomes difficult to, so let me see. Hi, Shamna. Yeah. Hi, Rishi. How are you? Yes, I'm good. How are you? Fine, fine. Thank you. Yeah, it's already, I think, how many years? Six years we met, close to six years. I think 16, 2016 is when we came to Talaseri, right? Uh, That's correct. Not yeah. very sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah 2016 yeah, December. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah. this December it will be six years. Time flies. Yes, truly time flies. How are your kids? Yeah, they're good. Uh, the elder one is now 11. And the younger one is uh, nine plus. So, yeah. <laughs> Time to make another trip to Kerala. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now you'll be free. Don't have to look after the kids. Yes, yes, yes. In fact, I still remember that uh, Rachi and Shadesh, they both helped out so much that they had to take pills to <laughs> come down at night. Prachi. <laughs> like, like their body was aching in the night, you know. <laughs> <laughs> did you enjoy uh, the uh, tour? Did, did you actually see Kerala or you were uh, watching? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, we, we absolutely enjoyed, uh, you know, I mean, uh, of course, whatever part we saw together, uh, that uh, boating and all that. And, okay. uh, and then, of course, I think we bifurcated from there and we went to this. Munnar. Uh, Munnar. Munnar, yes, yes, yes. It was amazing. Uh, okay. It was very beautiful. And I told Kaushal that, you know, uh, I have to come to Kerala again. Uh, we all have to come to again, Kerala again. And of course, I'll have to make a separate trip uh, with just me and my camera. <laughs> ah, yes. You can come to Dubai also. Yes, 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 yes. yes. It's definitely in the list of things. <laughs> okay. I think we are too much into personal. Okay. This is... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's give it... Two more minutes, let's say. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Since it's an online platform, everyone has trouble getting on. Yep, yep, yep. Hello, Linu Kumar. Uh, hi. Hello, Hello. Linu Kumar. Yeah, we have. Yeah. I yes, want to introduce Shinjul Shin 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 also. He is also from uh, uh, my region, actually. He's an engineering student, just, uh, just uh, for the uh, final year exams. So. Uh, very good, very good. Uh, hi, Shinjul. Can uh, you yeah. introduce yourself? Because introduce you are my... the first student in SFIX. I am Dr. <laughs> Shamna. Shamna, okay. I shall okay. introduce myself. Okay, okay, I am a, an ophthalmologist practicing okay. in Dubai. Dubai, okay, okay, thank you. Okay. I'm Lili Kumar, uh, physics lecturer, Gurudev Arts and Science College, Payano. Okay, yes, uh, uh, I have heard about you from 
Shaji a lot. Like uh, they visited your place. Yes, so, yes. yeah, he was quite appreciating your work, what you're doing there. Okay, thank you thank for you. Uh, <laughs> coming, being a member of this fixed meeting. Okay, okay. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> A great opportunity. <laughs> yeah, most welcome. Uh, yeah. Shital, how are you? While I we are waiting. Ready. While you're what? Oh, while we are waiting. Eating Shinjul? Correct. His name is Shinjul, no? Shinjul, correct. How, how do you spell it? Spelling. Spelling S H I N J U L. Shinjun. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, where are you doing engineering? Shaji, shift your camera. Yeah. Oh, shift the camera is there, right? I'm turning the computer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not used to this. Ah, sorry. Yeah. So, I can say some praises for uh, Shinjun. Uh, while he was in high school in 11th and 12th grade, uh, one of the colleges in Kerala organized a science exhibition and he and three more students, uh, three independent groups, uh, they won the first place. This was an international event. Apparently, there were uh, participants from uh, other countries and the first place award was uh, get an admission and all the all the pay, uh, fees is paid. So his four years education was paid completely by the award he won. And uh, they had a two week uh, visit uh, to United States and uh, they visited the NASA uh, center uh, there. So pretty, and he was covered in television all through that two weeks. So wow. I found it impressive story. and his okay. whole experience, He's also interested in uh, Kerala culture very much, uh, especially Kalari. So Linu Kumar also, I think they might have some common ground there. So he has been practicing Kalari for the last uh, six years, I suppose. And, oh. yeah, yeah. So Kalari I think is Linu Kumar art. also. Yeah, martial art. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Amazing. I think I shouldn't say too much because Linu Kumar, who is in our audience, he's also... Uh, uh, much more than I think he's probably doing all his life. I think he has been practicing coloring. So uh, pretty remarkable. And I visited his, his coloring center, if I were to call it. Uh, pretty impressive uh, uh, his community they have built there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So that's my <laughs> introduction of Shindil. But you should say something, Shindil. Feel free. So um, have... What was the experiment that he made? Go ahead. The experiment was converting the waste blast materials into a useful fuel, which can be refined to use in automobile system by the method of pyrolysis. Okay, okay. Fine. That was cool. Yeah, that looks very cool. Yeah, we are honored that you are here in our Speak Science Center. Uh, tell that again, Shamna. I said we are honored that you are in Swick Science Center. Oh, yes. Yeah, thank you. Isn't it? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for pointing out. Yeah. Yes. And uh, like another thing, uh, uh, which college is he studying? He studied in the uh, Institute of Engineering and Technology. Okay, you are basically from Talasheri. Yeah, oh, not only Talasheri, Shamna, probably you know his father. Uh, he's Jyoti, uh, Jyotish, apparently, Jyotish Shasan. He lives three houses, uh, Sridharatan. He lives opposite to that house. Don't know. Okay, yeah. ah, I don't know. Okay. Maybe it's. Three eight, I think we should start. I think yeah. uh, it, that's yeah. Okay. So today we have uh, uh, Rishikesh Vaidya as our speaker. He's from Bits Pilani, and he will 
have a discussion on a critical appraisal of Newton's law. Thank you, Rishi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks, Shadish. Thanks for this uh, wonderful opportunity and for this platform. I think this is a great platform for people who are just curious about physics and are having fun uh, doing and learning physics. I think be it students or be it teachers. So I think it's a nice opportunity for all of us to just get together and uh, discuss stuff that we are having fun doing. So uh, this is, you know, I think this uh, talk, um, I got this idea of giving this talk uh, from our discussions that we had in the last in the last talk. So I thought that it would be nice, uh, you know, um, I typically, I teach one course in the first year uh, called Mechanics, Oscillations and Waves. Uh, and the course, I typically open that course with the first lecture, which is a critical appraisal of Newton's laws. So I think uh, what I would like to do and discuss is best described by this a short footnote in the beautiful book by A.P. French, Newton in Mechanics. Uh, one of the chapter actually opens with this footnote, a, tap, uh, a chapter which discusses the Newton's laws. Uh, it says, you will undoubtedly have solved many problems in the use of Newton's laws before reading this chapter. Do not on that count assume that the following discussion is superfluous. A wish to get down to business, writing equations and using them is very sound. The quantitative use of a physical theory is an essential part of the game. Physics is not a spectator sport. But to gain real insight and understanding, where do equations come from? What do they really say? one must also examine the basic assumptions and phenomena. And some of the greatest advances in physics have come about in just this way. Einstein arrived at special relativity by thinking deeply about the nature of time. And Newton, when asked once about how he gained his insight into the problems of nature, replied by constantly thinking unto them. So of course, this is a tall order and uh, We'll just be scratching the surface of what AP French is hinting at. Okay, so uh, let me admit that essentially, uh, whatever I'll be discussing today, uh, most of it is, of course, familiar, uh, almost all of it is familiar to everyone. But I think this will be a nice opportunity for us to uh, maybe pose a question or two and deepen our understanding of the same. Okay. So I appreciate that I'm talking to uh, a plus two student. And uh, you know, what is the question that mechanics is trying to understand? So mechanics is trying to explain. The motion. That we see around. Is it readable? Yes. Okay. Now, the word explain in physics and in science, of course, acquires a different proportion. Uh, we explain poetry, we explain things in other branches of knowledge, but uh, what is it that constitutes a physical explanation? That is what makes the people who gave uh, great theories great. Okay, um, now, you know, intuitively, we all know, intuitively, we all know that this explanation of motion uh, would rely upon three things, matter or mass, which was roughly uh, translated as total quantity of matter. Uh, and force. And motion. Okay. So intuitively, we all know that this three, these three quantities are related. Okay. I so think Rishi, question. Yes, yes. <laughs> So, are these three uh, terms that you used 
taken for granted do we know this what no, this no 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 exactly the whole idea is to precisely understand okay so i think uh, it is a good starting point to begin with what we intuitively speak about things that you know by mass i mean things around okay and uh, i'll tell that you know okay what is our intuitive understanding and that of course these things need to be quantified and that is precisely what explanation means okay sure. yeah sure. okay yeah so so for example i would say that you know even a child would roughly know that you know things that he or she can hold and throw and bite at is what is the thing that we are interested in intuitively okay and even a child knows that uh, you know if he or she wants to push on the pram the child tries to stand up and push on it right so unless uh, the child pushes on it the pram won't move or the the you know whatever the object that uh, he or she is pushing at won't move so i think intuitively it is more or less clear that you know uh we are interested in knowing what we vaguely call motion okay although we have no quantitative understanding of what actually motion means i mean unless and until newton came around and told us and we vaguely know what force means that we have to expend ourselves in order to make things move so we have a vague understanding of what force is and mass is largely you know things that we see around is what typically our vague intuitive understanding of mass is you know the quantity of matter that we see around could be varying things but they all have one thing in common uh, and that is what we intuitively call mass uh, we will of course uh, refine this notions and i think it was also clear since antiquity that any explanation uh, will relate this three quantities i think it was not i mean it was more or less known for all this but precisely what the relationship is okay uh is what was quantified by newton so mass in fact even newton frankly did not provide a really quantitative understanding of mass uh so it is quantity of matter in fact newton wrote uh, newton gave mass as you know uh, the density times the volume uh, which hardly explains because then how do you explain density okay and uh, force is that i mean roughly we know that agent that agent which is somehow related to motion okay that these two are related and of course this quantity also must play a role in that relation so what when we say that we want to explain the motion what we sought was law of causality okay that gives an equation and that sort of gives uh, an understanding that you know an effect is proportional to the cause and i think force was intuitively known to be a causative agent and motion was intuitively known to be effect okay but what exactly is motion it was not clear so people thought that the natural state of things is to you know move for some time and then stop that was known to be uh, a natural state of all bodies that they have to move for some time and it has to stop now when you are looking for a law of causality and you are aiming to explain it so that explanation has to uh what i would like to call as you know mufta mufta okay what i mean by that 
that the quantities that you define, okay, they should be measurable. And the quantities which enter your law, they should have an absolute character. Okay. So A for absolute, M for measurable. And whatever law that you hope to provide should have a fair amount of universality. Okay, so you for universality. And of course, it should be uh, fairly fundamental. By fairly fundamental, what I mean is that, you know, because we are, the, the, the aim is very ambitious. We are explaining the cause of motion. So, it should be the most fundamental level layer of reduction. I mean that you know, everything else should follow from this. Okay. And of course, should be a stable. So it should make unique predictions and those predictions should be borne out by experiments. So it is this. So as I said, you know, I think more or less people knew that such a law has to involve the quantity of matter because people knew that more quantity of matter required higher, higher force. And people knew that somehow this cause was related to the motion. I mean, the effect is uh, effect called motion is related to the cause called force. Okay. So all this was, I think fairly, I mean, but what was lacking is that, you know, we didn't have a theory or a model that use quantities which were measurable that uh, we had, a, we didn't have a law uh, that had an absolute character. Uh, we had no clue about the universality of, you know, the relations uh, and the fundamentality and the testability. That's where the, so I think the biggest observation that was made was about the natural state Sorry, I'm actually using a new pen uh, whose pressure and all that I'm not used to. Natural state. People thought that Christian. body is... Ha, ah, yes. Uh, can you tell me more about how is the law of causality coming into picture? You mentioned it. Uh, maybe yeah, I yeah. missed so, what you said. Yeah, no, no. So what, I, what, what I'm trying to say is that, that what does it mean to explain the motion? Okay. So we must be able to find a law that uh, explains the causal relationship between the cause and effect. Okay, unless we come up with a law that uh, provides a quantitative causal relationship between cause and effect, we cannot, we could not have explained the motion. Okay, what a scientific so explanation it, means. So would it be correct to say that Newton's laws are causal always? Uh, no, the Newton's second law is actually a statement of the law of causality that force is the cause of uh, the change in momentum, which is the effect. So we cannot affect the past from the present. Is that uh, a statement? Uh, is that inbuilt in Newton's law? Uh, it, it actually it follows it, uh, the uh, so it, it is causality, uh, not in the sense of you know. Um, I think it was never uh, this whole, you know, that the uh, uh, the causality, you know, uh, uh, events unfolding into definite future from past. Okay, I don't think it has it has ever been articulated like that. Uh, at least not to my knowledge, before the theory of relativity. But uh, whatever phenomena that you see, you know, if you are recording changes, that changes have to have a cause. So. Can you quantify changes? And if you can quantify changes, can you relate them to some cause? That was the idea. Okay. So by law of causality, okay, um, that was what was meant. Okay. Okay.
I hope that uh, explains. Sure, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. So, and I think one of the crucial things, as I said, you know, intuitively people know that it takes more force to move heavier things. Uh, and that, of course, you know, uh, motion is related to force. Uh, but one of the crucial lack in arriving at a quantitative understanding of causal relationship was the understanding of the natural state of bodies. People thought that it is natural for body to stop after some time. Uh, but it was Galileo. Uh, I think, um, uh, I'm not so sure about the history, but it was Galileo who was one of the first to point out that the natural state of the body. So, I mean, people said that, you know, things stop. So people perform experiments with smoother and smoother things. And people found that uh, smoother the surface, longer it takes for the body to come to rest. Uh, so which means that if you can make the surface perfectly smooth, then the body would never come to rest and it would move on with the... So to move with a uniform velocity, to move with In, uh, actually, this pan is very different from what I'm typically used to. Uh, uniform speed forever. Okay, this is the natural state. I think. And uh, from this, she, ha, yes. I think you said it right earlier. You want to say velocity, right? You want to keep the direction also, right? Ha, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, of course. You know, so uniform. You said it a lot. Be, Yes, 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 yes. Okay, uniform velocity forever. Uh, I think this was the uh, starting point. So, you know, once one realizes that uh, the natural state is to, you know, move on forever, okay, then it means that if things uh, come to standstill, they're definitely uh, impacted by force which impede their motion and bring them to stop. This also would mean that, you know, if deceleration requires a force, acceleration would also require a force. Okay. So, uh, does this uh, comment again, does uh, this statement hold even with uh, all the effects, modern effects taken into account? Like, like for example, quantum effects? Uh, see, actually, uh, we have to understand that uh, what is the, you know, uh, at what scale we are talking about. So, obviously, you know, with time we came to know that quantum mechanics is the current mechanics and uh, Newtonian mechanics and Newtonian laws are only an approximation to a deeper mechanics called uh, quantum mechanics and Newtonian mechanics can be obtained as some sort of averaging of the aggregates of bodies, you know, in some type of limit, limiting case of the quantum mechanics. Okay. So all I'm saying only holds true for macroscopic bodies. Sure. The, the, the true dynamics is governed by the, uh, okay, non linguistic limit Schrodinger equation and ideally quantum field theory. So, uh, Rishi, the, yeah. uh, I have a, like you can consider it a comment or a question both because um, I thought that F equal to MA is valid everywhere. It's the law of nature. I don't think it assumes anything. Like my comment was in the concern that if if we have a vacuum, quantum vacuum, mm -hmm. it is, uh, it is at, at least expected that it will have friction on a moving, uh, let's say, a, a neutral body that is moving with uniform velocity. So that will, that is, that contradicts this. Why contradict? Because then, because then we have quantum friction. Yeah, if there is a quantum friction, there is a reason for that friction. There is a causal agent for that friction. Okay, okay, yeah, okay. So okay. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Okay. No, 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 please, no, no, please understand the context. Okay. What I'm trying to say is we are trying to understand that, you know, what is it 
that gave birth to the uh, you know what was the breaking point so when f equals ma was given by newton what was the state of affairs what was the motivation what is it that people knew okay so the idea is to you know that uh, it was i think this law of inertia as understood by galileo which provided a seed for the further development of dynamics as conceived by newton that's the idea i'm trying to convey sure, sure. yeah sorry i went uh, beyond no, no, the no no no, 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 no. your comments are perfectly fine and uh, prachi i completely agree but my point is you know when you say f equals ma you have a definite framework in mind right that that you have uh, you know you can make arbitrary measurements in fact this is the whole idea is to understand that what are the uh, assumptions which have gone into making f equals ma okay so you have a definite assumption of you know localization a body with a mass and a precise momentum and an ability to make measurements non destructive measurements which can uh, i mean uh, that we can locate the body as well as the momentum simultaneously with infinite precision okay all these things are not true so the whole mechanics is different you know when the whole formulation of mechanics is different in quantum mechanics and we obtain the newton newton in mechanics in the appropriate limit okay so newton and mechanics is not the absolutely correct mechanics it's a uh, it's an approximation that holds at macroscopic level that's the idea so when you say that they are true they are applicable but you cannot uh, apply f equals ma to electron that's the whole idea right well we'll come back to this rishi again yeah 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 let's continue yeah yeah, yeah. okay so um the point is that the natural state is to move forever and uh, from here the the second law is conceived so as a corollary to this one can see that you know uh, if there is a change in velocity okay then it of course calls for a force and um, uh, okay so in fact uh, so it's okay so the second law says that the impressed force is proportional to to so this a so it is not the velocity but the acceleration that is a true measure of effect and it is the force which is a true measure of cause okay and of course uh, such a relationship must pay heed to the quantity of matter so m is a measure of the quantity of matter okay and this constant of proportionality can be absorbed in the definition of units so actually one can write f as i mean so it is this you know quantitative definition people intuitively knew that these three things are related but newton provided them in the form of an equation and not just that uh you know it's actually this equation is a coming together of geometry analysis and algebra okay so what has to provide a quantitative measure of what quantities are involved so at a deeper level you know in one stroke when you write this you know people knew that uh, so uh, if uh, the uniform velocity uh, the, the, the velo it's a constant velocity uh, is a natural state and uh, to change the constant velocity forces are required okay but velocity and acceleration you know your v uh, is r dot and a 
is v dot okay so this whole definition of uh, uh, the derivative or the, the rate of change you know uh, as uh, the, the ratios of uh, limiting con uh, the ratio uh, um, the ratios of two infinitesimally small quantities you know as the time uh, in the vanishing time uh, what is the change in uh, displacement and in the vanishing time what is the change in velocity as t goes to zero so newton had to involve uh, in a, had to invent calculus in order to quantify the uh, the the measure of effect in terms of acceleration and uh, f and a are directional quantities and their characters different from m okay so uh, although uh, this terminology called vectors was not known uh, in that time but he had to also provide a law of how different forces are supposed acting on a body then how different forces superpose okay so if there are two forces say f1 and f2 acting on a body okay then what is the effect combined effect of these two forces so newton provide provided the answer uh, in the form of the law of parallelogram of course this was not due to newton the law of parallelogram of uh, uh, addition of forces was known since antiquity i think uh, uh, perhaps even to the greeks it was known uh, but the point is this the quantities like f and a they are uh, vectors and they add in a they can be superposed in a specific way that algorithm was given and that the mass is additive uh, is arithmetically additive you know two bodies have masses m1 and m2 they just add up normally so if you look at it uh, you know these are the ideas of the uh, there are the seeds of the ideas of a vector space that you have a vector uh, you have a mathematical structure of a vector space and a scalar multiplication is possible and the result is again a member of the same vector space and that the two vectors can be added and the resultant is also a member of the vector space uh, and that they, they follow a law of uh, parallelogram so it was actually a profound synthesis of geometry analysis and algebra what i'm trying to drive home is a point that although uh, you know even a child would force harder to move a heavier object uh, but to know that the quantification of motion is not in terms of velocity but acceleration and that they are related by the equation was uh the greatest achievement of newton okay now of course uh, newton did not conceive of this form law in this form f equals ma he in fact um uh, defined a quantity called quantity of motion and that is a product of mass and velocity okay to define the quantity called quantity of motion uh because uh, you know it was clear to him that a body of 2 kg uh, thrown with a speed of uh, 4 meters per second and a body of 4 kg mass and thrown with a speed of 2 uh, meters per second their impact would be similar so the motion of two different bodies with two different velocities would still be identical as long as the product is similar so the second law that he defined uh, the causal relationship that he defined was not in terms of f equals ma but as a rate of change of the quantity of motion which is the momentum okay this is the quantity that he called momentum uh, And, and and the beauty of this definition is that uh of course when m is constant it boils down to f equals ma but this is true even for mass varying system and it is also true it turn, it turned out to be true even in the relativistic regime
what is more the definition of momentum paved way for the conservation laws which are far more profound than the uh, profound and universal than the equations themselves so for example uh, the newton's laws of motion are not uh, i mean they cannot be naively applied to uh, uh, quantum mechanics but the the conservation laws they transcend uh, all physics you know they are always true so conservation laws in some sense are even more fundamental because they derive from the properties of space and time and that's that's why in some sense they are more they are even more fundamental than the uh, laws of dynamics so uh, his definition of the second law was not f equals me but f equals dp by dt to elucidate certain aspects we will currently confine ourselves to the f equals me definition okay now if you try and apply this definition to a simple scenario you know uh, suppose if you are going in a bus uh, and if the bus applies a brake then obviously we are all uh, thrown forward uh, and apparently there is of course uh, no force acting on us and yet we suffer acceleration so how do we explain this from the newton's laws of motion because there is no force affecting on it so there is a qualification in this definition that f here stands for real forces okay the physical forces uh which have definite origin it could be tension friction normal reaction gravity coulomb force okay so now if you are traveling in a bus and if the driver applies a brake or he or she navigates a turn then of course uh, we suffer an acceleration and there is no causative agent lurking in the side there is no real force acting on us so how do we explain such phenomena within the framework of newton's laws so it turns out that the uh, this laws are applicable only uh, to a class of frame why is sorry this pen only to a class of frames called inertial frames okay it, it cannot be applied so when we when the driver applies a brake to the bus it turns out that the uh, uh, bus decelerates and uh, accelerating or decelerating frames are not the right frames for the application of the newton second law so what are the right frames for the uh, application of the second law and that's where the foundation for the application of the second law is provided by the first law okay so second law gives a signature of the uh, uh, that you know what is the signature of the application of the force the signature of the application of the force is the the effect that is the acceleration okay but before that one has to know what is the signature of no force how do we know that there is no force acting so the first law okay uh, let me see if i can just paste it here instead of writing uh, that will make it a little faster Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry. So, what if something is going with uniform velocity while the mass is changing? Does that constitute an inertial frame? Uh, if something is going with a uniform velocity and its mass is changing, uh, so then one has to see that you know when the uh, suppose you have a uh, 
suppose if you know you have a leaky truck okay so if you have a leaky truck and there is a the sand which is leaking off the truck uh, it's not uh, going to change any uh, velocity of the truck okay suppose if you just drop off the bus okay uh, it's not going to change the velocity of the bus so it's an initial frame there is no issue with that as long as the velocity doesn't change it's an initial frame only if it accelerates ma mass is not important okay so mass doesn't come in the definition of the initial frame okay yeah so um, oh. suppose you are you know you are going by a bus which is going with a constant velocity and you just drop off the bus just drop off by meaning you know you are not really exerting any force so when you drop off the bus you are uh, your relative velocity with respect to the bus is zero right so the bus will continue moving with the same velocity and it will still continue constituting the initial frame so we are, we are we are defining okay now so what is it the you know what is it that constitutes the initial frame okay. so um the first law says so in fact the first law okay so now that you have posed this question uh this first law provides the it, it does two things it provides the definition of the initial frames and it's an assertion that they exist okay so it says every body perseveres in its state of being at rest or of moving uniformly straight forward except in so far as it okay i have taken this directly from the the, the authoritative translation of the principia okay <laughs> so it's exactly how uh, uh, newton had framed it in latin and this is an authoritative translation of the principia so everybody perseveres in a state of being at rest or of moving uniformly straight forward except in so far as it is compelled to change its state by forces impressed okay so Uh, but before we you know see that how this uh constitutes a definition for initial frame uh you have to understand that you know when it says every body what is meant by a body it's not very clear this definition is quite loose because you know if i have a time bomb which is set to go after some time okay say in 10 minutes so after 10 minutes the bomb you know splits into many particles which fly off in all directions uh and uh, no external forces acted upon it and yet the uh, what you call body is no longer the same body right and can you say the time bomb time bomb is at rest so uh, so the body is actually quite ill defined here uh, and if you say that the body is something which is structureless then of course that's also a problematic thing um uh, and the moment it has a structure then you can conceive of something like a time bomb now we one might say that okay you know if the time bomb goes off the center of mass of the time bomb doesn't move still right so one has to invoke the notion of center of mass but the notion of center of mass of course also involves the notion of the third law okay so uh the point i also want to drive home is that that actually these three laws put together are actually uh they provide a complete system for application to dynamical systems okay uh and it says it's in a state of a question here ah, yes, yes yes don't you think, don't you think that the first law is already trying to define the system like system is important to be defined here right like if you are talking about the motion of something what is it like it is related to charles's question also when mass is changing what will you what will you consider as a system it has to be defined somewhere either it is defined in the second law or it is defined in the first law that m is your system right yeah 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 so so we will have to think when we talk about like uh, what what defines the inertia a uh, frame of reference we have to keep that particular mass in in our perspective right okay so okay i did not state this uh, in the beginning uh, but you know i okay i wanted to start with a typical problem in mechanics that what is the problem of mechanics if one has to define problem of mechanics in one line that given 
a given material system and the knowledge of its initial state and all the forces acting on it can we predict the trajectory as a function of time okay that's the problem of mechanics okay so i i thought that okay i mean so this is uh, when when i said in the beginning that uh, uh, we are trying to understand the motion motion of what motion of the system of interest and see this this is the challenge okay uh, when we are trying to define the fundamental grammar we are compelled to make use of vocabulary which is yet to be defined okay so uh, as you will see that the whole notion of mass cannot i mean we, we will have to make use of the newton's law to define you know what mass is and what this thing okay as you will see so but we have a general notion of a thing of interest on which forces act and whose motion we are interested in so the first and foremost question is what is motion so motion of any body is a product of its quantity of matter and the velocity so quantity of motion is defined by momentum okay this is as basic as it can get now what is the change in motion which mandates application of force or which mandates a cause that change in motion is the change in momentum okay that mandates the application of a cause called force now it turns out that when you have this equation we ran into trouble we ran into a situation where we had you know a situation where the person is standing in a bus the driver applies a brake and the person is thrown forward and it doesn't follow the newton's law because there is no force acting and yet you know there is an effect on acceleration so that naturally tells us that this law has to have a frame of reference okay so what i'm trying to do here is to motivate the need for first law because intuitively when you think about dynamics you would want your first instinct is not to come up with a frame of reference frame of reference is a concoction from need where your direct application of law of causality will fail okay that's the point of view that i'm trying to drive home am i making it clear that now we now we came to appreciate that there is a need for frame of reference this f equals ma is not true everywhere we ran into a farcical situation where there is an acceleration there is no cause so there has to be a a system of reference where this is true what is that system of reference that is answered by the first law okay however the first law itself before it answers raises many questions that is what i'm trying to tell you that the whole notion of body as i say is actually quite ill defined and it says it preserves a state of being at rest or of uniform straight forward motion or straight uniform rectilinear motion now when you say that the body is at rest rest with respect to what rest with respect to what so uh newton had to invoke absolute space okay so he said all motions are defined with respect to and so you know uh in the principia even before this laws appear they precede by definition of you know absolute time and absolute space why newton had to introduce absolute space because he knew that uh keeping any any heavenly body as a reference say stars or sun you know they are all moving so they are they do not serve as a proper frame of reference so he was compelled to introduce absolute space in order to define the uh, you know some inertial frame with respect to which you can define a state of rest or of uniform rectilinear motion but there are problems when you say that a uniform motion in a straight line how do you define a straight line 
Okay. So the nice approach to define a straight line would be to take a ruler and see that if I have points A and B, and if they are connected by a straight ruler, then they lie in a straight line. But who says that the ruler is straight? So we said that, okay, you take a thread and tie it between point A and B and uh, stretch it. So uh, the stretched thread would constitute a straight line between point A and B. So you can make a ruler using a stretched thread. But the point is, as we know now in hindsight, that uh, a thread would be affected by gravity. So there is no guarantee that a thread would be straight. Okay. So you can say that, okay, now let me, you know, uh, look from point A to point B. If I have a torch and there's a line, uh, light coming from uh, point A to point B, then it's a, the path of the light defines a straight line for me. But even light is bent by gravity. Okay. In hindsight, we know that. So the whole point is that the whole definition of straight line is actually uh, contingent upon the Euclidean geometry. But the whole Euclidean geometry, the notion of straight line and the, you know, the geometrical postulates, how do you know the nature of geometry? In hindsight, we now know that uh, you have to make measurements and to make measurements, you used objects which follow the laws of nature. So all these things are not that easy to define. Okay. What I'm trying to say is that now in the hindsight, we see that actually this, these things are not, uh, if you look at it critically, it's not easy to define these things. However, there's a lesson here. You know, the reason that physicists made progress is because, you know, they sometimes, you know, use approximate concepts, which are not rigorously defined and they use them as a crutch. And they obtain approximate answers, which work for most of the those things. Okay. And later on, you know, as more progress is made, those approximations are refined and then the crutch is so my favorite analogy here is that of, a, you know, um, let us compare this high jump, you know, uh, how much high can a man jump? So, you know, there is a certain record, you know, one cannot jump higher than certain this thing, right? But in a pole vault, one can really jump much higher, right? Using a pole, a pole of uh, length, which is much higher than the uh, man's height. If one can use it tactfully, one can jump much higher. And then, you know, as one crosses over the bar, one can leave the pole and goes to the other side without touching the bar. Okay. So, uh, you know, uh, this is what I would say that, uh, you know, a history of physics is replete with such uh, pole wall jumps where people have used crutches, which is illegal, but that has helped them scale greater heights and then the pole was left. So, uh, that's the, you know, uh, uh, the message that here that we should try and uh, take about the Newton's because this, as you will see that the Newton's uh, notion of absolute space was uh, uh, met with a very critical perception by the physicist community. Okay. Uh, so everybody preserves the states. Uh, so the whole point is, you know, uh, before one decide, uh, before one defines the effect, one has to define the uh, signatures of no force. And the signature of no force is given by the first law that in absence of any force, uh, if you see that there are no causative agent and if the body is enjoying a uniform motion in a straight line, then this observation must have been made in a frame called inertial frame. And that observe, and that observe is called the inertial observer. Okay. So, it's clear that the observation made in an accelerating bus is not an initial frame. And that's why the first law has stated it's not applicable. Second law has stated it's not applicable to it. One has to uh, find a way to apply the second law to non initial reference systems. Okay. So the first law is actually, um, so second law stands on the pedestal of the first law. It defines the, so first law is not just plain tautology, but it provides the platform of inertial reference frame. And then all the measurements in second law are referred to such an inertial frame. I hope that clarifies. Um, sure. Yeah. Any questions here? 
No. Yes, no. I have a question. Ah, yeah, 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 sure. Uh, you said it was necessary that mass and velocity be put together, and it is a change in mass times velocity that is equal to the force. Uh, yeah. That seems to suggest that uh, mass has time dependence, and that's okay. And uh, wouldn't that uh, mean that there is some dynamics or, or there is some motion associated with mass itself and, uh, or, or put it like this, when we think of motion as acceleration, hmm. one can think force helps motion and mass resists motion. Yes. Right? In that way, the causes of the force and mass is independent of the dynamics, correct? Right? Now you have put in a time dependence or if you allow time dependence in there, that seems to couple it and I have some discomfort with it, but it's just a discomfort. I cannot uh, think of any, any actual example where this might be really uh, going off. Uh, so um, it's, is, is this what, uh, it's necessary to do this, is it? You cannot, no, for no. example, my, my reservation would be when yeah. in Lorentz law, like in electrodynamics, we really have a difference between momentum, like the canonical momentum and the usual momentum. And Lorentz uh, force is yeah. written as mass times the change in velocity not as change in momentum. So is it uh, something something important or is there anything relevant? No, so there? actually, no, so uh, when mass is constant, of course it becomes uh, mass times velocity, right? Mass times acceleration. Okay. Uh, that's no problem. Eh? Ha, yeah. Now, uh, if you want to take into account the variation of mass, Okay, then uh, there is a way to do it. You have to make sure, so you start with the Newton's second law, F equals dp by dt, and you make sure that the mass that you uh, take into account at time t and at time t for delta t is kept constant. So you account for the, so if there is mass is changing for a given system, then either it is taking away the momentum with it or it is adding momentum to the system, right? right. So, as long well, as... Maybe you... I can... What's the reason Newton had to... Uh, what is the reason Newton had to put this in this form? Is there anything specific key? Yeah, basically, what we know is like MA came way later, right? F equals yeah. MA was put later. Why did Newton wrote it as dp by dt to begin with? Because, because you know, Newton conceived of, uh, you know, as I said, the whole analysis was done in terms of the motion. Okay, what is it that constitutes motion? The crucial question was not velocity or mass. The crucial question was, what is it that constitutes motion? So, of course, motion has to do with velocity. But is velocity alone constituting the notion of motion? So it is the product. So of mass here is my question: velocity. What is motion? Intuitively, what would you associate motion with? The product of like mass velocity. Mass times product velocity of, or, exactly. Or axle. Momentum. Momentum is the motion. Momentum. Quantity of motion is momentum is nothing but the quantity of motion. He said that a different mass with a different velocity, if there can be multiple of such things which will have same effect when they interact with something else. And that is what is important, not mass individually or velocity individually. I see. Yes. I think he, he made the yeah. point. Yeah, yeah. The big point. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Have a, I, the individual differences don't matter as long as the product is. You know what, what is important for the notion of motion is the product of mass times velocity. And and it is that the change in motion is what is the measure of change. And it is such a measure of change which mandates the application of force. So F is dp by dt. Okay. Now, uh, you know, uh, 
let us come to the law three. It's actually very important. Law three says uh, that if you have a body one and a body two, suppose the force on body one due to body two is F12. When the third law says that there is no such thing as, you know, okay, uh, before I do that, actually, you know, I think I'm very much impeded by writing. I'm really, I mean, looking at the screen and writing here, uh, it's just, okay, uh, let me put it this way. Uh, second law, uh, second law is F equals, uh, let us look at it in the form of F equals MA. So you have F equals MA. So what does it say? So as you have a system of interest whose mass is M, that is a system of interest. Second law bifurcates the universe into two parts, system of interest and the rest of the universe where forces originate. So forces originate in the rest of the universe and they act upon system of interest to change the dynamics of system of interest. That is the essential content of the second law. Okay, now, Third law says is that there is no such thing as, you know, system of interest and forces originating uh, that, okay. So there is no such thing as just the force on the system. If you have a force on mass one due to mass two, then concurrently, there is a force on body two due to body one. And this are always simultaneous and they are equal and opposite. This is given. Now, if one looks at it from the perspective of second law, then if F12 is a force on body one, then it is dp1 by dp2, or dp1, dp1 by dt, and F21, is dp2 by dt. Okay, so given that f12 plus f21 is zero, this tells me that the momentum of a closed system is conserved. Okay. Now, one might say that, you know, in my second law, I have this mass M and F acting on it and F equals dp by dt. Okay. So, obviously, if F is zero, dp by dt is zero, right? So isn't the third law already contained in second law? Because second law says that when the force is zero, momentum is conserved, right? So isn't the third law already contained in second law? Or for that matter, in the first law, the first law says that a body free from any external influence continues to move with uniform velocity or state of rest, the momentum is conserved, right? So isn't it even, so isn't there some kind of redundancy in the laws here? Probably it has to do with consistency maybe that when you split two masses. Not consistency, like uh, that's a single body system, right? And Newton's law is not, third law is not applied on the single body. So third law is actually considering the uh, the system and the environment together. And that's where the conservation laws arises. Like you have to create that closed system. Second law is not having a closed system. Exactly. So Shadesh, you know, what, 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 you know, the trouble is, trouble with my argument is that, you know, suppose, suppose there is no third law and you have, F equals say 
dp by dt so here is a block of mass m lying and i apply a force f on it okay this is me applying the force on this mass m okay and uh, of course it changes the momentum by dp by dt but now nothing stops you from considering myself and the block as one system and of course uh, this force will change the momentum of this block and uh, there is a non zero momentum but if you look at this combined this whole system as one system then it will have a non zero momentum right right so you know third law is a profound prescription that's why i said the first law bifurcates the universe into two parts it's an action on the system of interest and the rest of the universe where forces originate and the arrow is from the outside to the you know system third law says that there is no such thing as you know sacred system of interest if there is a force acting on the system of interest then that system of interest is also implying the force on the whatever agency is acting on the system of interest so this arrow is bidirectional and it's a profound prescription of going from effect on the system of interest to interaction between two bodies okay so third law brings in this you know second law does not tell you how to deal with a many body system third law is a prescription to go from effect on the body of interest to interaction between bodies okay and of yeah. course the third third law seems to be intimately tied third and second law put together give you the momentum conservation right now so second law is always true and second law along with the third law gives the momentum conservation right so this means that whenever the third law is not valid the momentum conservation is in your party so i uh, i have some issues here yeah. so if you have two masses going with two accelerations under the action of two independent forces f1 m1 a1 f1 m2 a2 the first okay. one obeys f1 is equal to m1 a and the second one obeys f2 equal to m2 a now f1 the only is... thing we do is we... yeah m1, m1 a as a vector A but A one or A one? A one. A one. Huh. And the second is F two is equal to M two A. A two. A two. Yeah. Sorry. A two. Yeah. And now the only thing we do is we put M one and M two together, right? And mm -hmm. now we ask what is the motion? And the same two forces are acting on them independently. and now what happens like what is the new motion going to be is it going to be f1 over m1 plus f1 no 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 when you say that you are putting them together no no when you say that you are putting them together meaning like this yes so that we have the interaction forces which we don't have to worry because they are internal correct no no but oh, what do you mean to... by putting them together They're because if they are right? going no no they are going with the different accelerations Okay, so right. their velocities will be different. So you are basically right. colliding them. Uh, it's a collision. It's not. A... Let's say at one instant they were moving with the same velocity. Right at that instant, we put them together. There was yeah, an instantaneous velocity was common, but not the next velocities. Right? That's possible to imagine. No, that is possible. But then you have to also invoke the uh, forces of cohesion. Which will ensure that ah, this stick together. Exactly. And we have to ensure. Yeah, that's my point. Huh. Correct. That's exactly my point. And then that seems to suggest that they need not, they should not be the same. Correct. Which the internal or the one that is connecting the two. Okay. Just to have the accelerations different. 
no no but then you are mini sajesh see one has to also understand that what is the final outcome that one is interested in if you want them to go together then of course it's like you know you have a okay see, simple thing like this you know you have a mass connected to a spring and the mass is oscillating now you put a drop a putty on it obviously the putty has a different acceleration and the mass is a different acceleration but it sticks to it and then they move together right so if so they this, oh yeah so the moment they go together you are saying that exactly. accelerations are the same exactly yeah so it becomes f1 plus f2 divided by m1 plus m2 that's exactly the exactly and, and that will ensure that, that the forces of cohesion are equal and opposite that. And they have to be opposite to each other. Yes, yeah, okay. absolutely. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah, so whatever is that internal force has to cancel each other, otherwise this will not work. Exactly. Internal okay. forces okay. always cancel, yeah. That's why your body but is then it's... spontaneous. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. I, I get it, yeah. That Thanks. is the reason yeah. that bodies don't spontaneously start moving, right? Or even internal torques cancel, but of course there is an important assumption here that the forces are acting along the line of line joining the two. Yeah. Oh, they are rigid bodies, probably. That's it. Oh no, it doesn't have to be a rigid body, right? Does no, it have rigid. to be no? Uh, have to be. No, that the important assumption that you are making is that the forces are acting along the line joining the two. The actual reaction. Okay. So there is that there is you know there is a strong form of the third law. Which says that the action and reaction are equal and opposite, and they're you know, uh, but like you, you know, that you know, the third law is not valid in electrodynamics, right? Yeah, so, so what is have... the so what if we have this situation where the third law is violated? What would you, what do we conclude? Okay, so the point is it, here, it seems like that the you know, I mean, the way I look at it is here, it's like that the third law, of course, is third law along with the second law is intimately connected to the momentum conservation, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and so if the third law breaks down, that seems to imply that the momentum conservation is in jeopardy. But we do know that the in the electrodynamics, you know, if you have a charge going towards suppose the origin on the x-axis and another charge coming to the y-axis, uh, yes. then the, the resultant forces are equal, but they are orthogonal. They're not exactly in opposite oppositely directed so it turns out that the momentum conservation is of course you know so all this tells us that you know whenever you have contact forces or forces along the line joining the two bodies uh, it is consistent with the momentum conservation but if you have two bodies where the forces are not exactly uh, uh, along the line joining the two bodies then of course the forces are communicated by fields right Yes. And then once you factor yes. in the field momentum, the the momentum conservation is always true. Once you factor in the conservation, once you factor in the field momentum, then of course it is always true. Okay. Now, you know, we, we, we spoke about, so the, the whole point is, you know, okay. So as we can see that how the, you know, the first law, second law and third law, how they are acting in tandem, you know, I mean, they are not like acting independently in air. The second law requires the foundation of first law as the definition of industrial frame where it is true. And the, you know, uh, without the third law, you will have a farcical situation where momentum is not conserved. Okay. Now, uh, let us see how do we test the second law, F equals any. So basically, you know, second law can essentially provide the definition of force. Let us put it in the standard form F equals semi here. And it can provide the definition of force provided you obtain the definition of mass independently. It can provide you a measure of force provided you obtain the definition of mass 
without using the notion of force because you cannot say that m is equal to f by a and f equals m a that will be circular right so the challenge is how to obtain the notion uh, i mean how to measure mass without using f equals m a so shinjo any suggestion here so if you measure a mass in a weighing scale would it help by the way so in the any way, equation that has three any equation that has three forms when you are experimentally verifying all three have to be independently measured right so no you can so you can take one equation to be defining one quantity but then the other two okay the reason i told mass is because you know okay i think i'm skipping things here uh, acceleration is a kinematic attribute right you can always measure acceleration without worrying about f and m you can wow. just measure the change in velocity with time and so acceleration you can always obtain without worrying about f or m okay so okay so here okay you know i think uh, uh one important notion actually because we uh, got into too much of discussion so here the mass as newton conceived is actually it's a measure of inertia so you know why is it that bodies do not spontaneously go into acceleration mode you know why is it that the force is mandated for the uh, change in velocity so it turns out that uh, they must have some attribute by the virtue of which they resist the change of state and that attribute is basically mass or that mass uh, uh, the notion of mass which enters in the second law is called the inertial mass it is an attribute of bodies sorry this pen is just inertial mass is an attribute of the body by the virtue of which you know uh, they do not spontaneously of their own accord uh, change the state it 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 mandates the application of force to change the state okay now it turns out before we you know address this here it turns out that there is a force of gravity between two objects say earth and some body on earth uh say which goes as uh r squared or you know sorry either right i here or r squared okay so there is this force of gravity between two masses now uh how that doesn't matter okay so there is a force of gravity between two masses so what is this m sitting out here so just as you know you have a coulomb force okay between two charges where q is the uh, electrostatic charge so m here is some kind of gravitational charge by the virtue of which body is interacted by a gravitational force okay so a priori there is no reason for us to believe that the gravitational charge which is the reason behind gravitational force is same as the inertial mass okay so the mass which enters the second law is called the inertial mass and the mass which enters the newton's law of gravitation is called the gravitational mass okay now of course you know uh, if moment in the moment if time permits i'll show to you that how mg is actually equal to mi but this equality is actually a law of nature 
Okay, it's a separate law. Called the principle of equivalence, and this equality should not be a priori assumed. So when I said that you cannot use a weighing scale to measure the mass, that is because a weighing scale is a measure of the gravitational mass, and a priori there is no reason for us to believe that this is same as this. Okay. So how do we, how do we test the Newton's second law? Without using the notion of force as proportional to acceleration, and independently measure mass. Now suppose you know if I have two bodies, and I can give the same force to both the bodies. Okay, same force. Then of course you know I can equate. right i can then measure my accelerations take the ratios and obtain the uh, ratio of masses for two bodies right so if i can manage to give the same force to two bodies but the challenge is how do you do that without being able to measure the force of course one way to do is is to you know uh, use the spring force you don't really have to you can tie a mass m1 and stretch it by a fixed distance now we can perform experiments on the spring and we come to know that the spring force is just a function of the distance and it's actually a linearly restoring kind okay so we can tie the two masses one after another and measure their acceleration initial accelerations and then we don't have to know what exactly is the magnitude of f if we stretch them by the same amount we are guaranteed that the forces are equal because they are not depending on the mass so then we can measure the ratios of initial acceleration and come to take one mass as the standard mass and the other mass can be obtained in the unit of the standard mass alternatively actually third law can come to our rescue suppose two masses m1 and m2 uh if they are moving under just the influence of the mutual forces okay and they collide then we can use this because the third law guarantees the equality of the mutual force and the total momentum is conserved uh, sorry okay total momentum is conserved so then we can from here obtain this ratio in terms of this differences in velocities and one so here and two okay you can measure this and then obtain m2 in units of m1 and now that you have obtained both m and a separately you can use the second law to define your force so this is how you can test the second law so as you can see that you know uh, all of these uh, this laws they together form the uh, combine this thing now newton how did newton say that the acceleration is absolute we know that the velocity cannot be absolute if you remember that you know let us look at my laundry list that i made in the beginning that the quantities that can make it the law that can make their way in the law they have to be measurable so we saw how to measure each of this quantity 
you have to be absolute so velocity does not enter the second law it is acceleration which enters the second law okay because newton showed that actually acceleration is a absolute measure and they are most fundamental they are testable and they are universal you know they don't de depend upon the details of the matter you know whether silver gold or a brick or a, you know earth or moon or apple they are applicable to everything so there is a universality universality there is fundamentality and there is you know but now how did newton prove that the acceleration is the absolute so to show that let me Newton performed an experiment um i'm sure you all familiar with this experiment called a rotating bucket experiment okay so we have to prove that acceleration is absolute So Newton said that he took a bucket. Uh, is this diagram visible? Um, not to me, but maybe on the computer it is visible. I can read it on the computer. <laughs> is it uh, visible? And can you read? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So Newton said that you know, okay. So he wanted to prove that. acceleration has an absolute measure and measure with respect to what the fixed stars okay because fixed stars are the only thing that we have a reference because space is not actually a thing okay so he he took a bucket and it he hung it from the ceiling and the bucket is filled with water and uh, then he gave the string from which it is attached several twist okay now as the bucket unwinds uh the bucket is rotating of course but the surface of water is still it's flat okay now after a while the bucket is still of course unwinding but now the bucket is uh, the water has picked up some rotation okay and it actually spins and its surface acquires a curvature so now there is no relative motion between the bucket and the water sorry uh, a bucket in the water okay and in part 3 of the experiment uh the bucket is stopped from spinning but of course the water is still spinning okay so uh the conclusion is that this experiment proves the absolute nature of rotation of the water with respect to the uh fixed stars so inertial frames uh are the fixed stars because there is nothing other than fixed stars as our reference so why does it prove that acceleration is absolute because in the first case there is a relative motion between the water and the bucket right yet the surface of water is flat and in the third case also there is a relative motion between the water and the bucket yet the surface of water is curved okay and in this second case there is no relative motion between the water and the bucket and yet the surface is curved so the question is the surface of water is curved with respect to what the water is accelerating with respect to what so this acceleration of water is with respect to the fixed stars so this experiment for newton unambiguously proved that acceleration is absolute is this part clear um uh, uh, so uh, i think i missed this argument okay. maybe i okay okay yeah, yeah. i can part. i can i can i can i can repeat it rakesh so sorry sajesh yeah so i mean newton wanted to <clears throat> prove that uh there are special frames called inertial frames uh which uh, hold second place for writing the laws of physics and that is because you know i mean uh, uniform motion is indistinguishable uh, from rest 
but acceleration is absolute okay it has an absolute measure and uh, he wanted to prove that uh, he wanted to prove that acceleration is absolute so he performed this experiment he poured water in a bucket and hung it from the ceiling and initially gave this rope from which the water is hung the bucket is hung some twist so obviously as soon as the bucket is left the the rope untwists and the bucket starts spinning okay initially the bucket is spinning but the surface of water is flat okay so there is a relative motion between the water and the bucket but still the surface of water is flat right now of course you know uh, because of the viscous drag of course initially i mean later on the water picks up the rotation and at some point in time the water is moving along with the bucket and that's why you know its surface acquires a curvature but now there is no relative motion between the water and the bucket okay now suppose you suddenly stop the bucket from spinning make the bucket stationary but of course thanks to inertia the water will keep spinning for a while so there is still a curvature in the surface of the water okay so he proved this experiment as an argument that this rotation of the water is with respect to the fixed stars it's an absolute measure of rotation and it is with respect to the fixed stars so he wanted to prove that rotation is absolute or acceleration is absolute okay and why does it prove that this water is rotating with respect to the fixed stars simply because you know in three cases you know in case 1 there is a relative motion between the water and the bucket yet the surface of water is flat in case 2 there is no relative motion between water and the bucket yet the surface is curved and in case 3 again there is a relative motion between the water and the bucket yet the surface is curved so the question is is water spins with respect to what it is with respect to the fixed stars okay so that's why acceleration is absolute Now, how course, does you know, the bucket of water know about the existence of fixed stars? Exactly, you know, exactly. That is so. That was the major debate between. So Newton proved this as a proof of the absolute nature of the acceleration. Okay. However, there were. It was you know met, met with a very hostile reaction from Leibniz, who was Newton's contemporary. and a philosopher called berkeley they believe that all motion is relative either all motion is absolute or all motion is relative so their their point was that why is it that the nature chooses a preferred reference frame there should be no preferred reference frame uh, called inertial frames okay because if all motion is relative then there is no preferred reference frame and they took strong objection of newton uh, to define the inertial frame with respect to absolute space because newton so once you say that you know i have an inertial frame with respect to absolute space then the absolute space serves as the you know seat of inertia the inertial properties of matter have their origin with respect to the absolute nature of the space so whereas seat, the absolute space serves as the seat of origin for inertia but the space itself is absolute and cannot be acted upon now if you take your reference for inertial frames as fixed stars then stars are also matter and then you know you cannot define one frame to be inertial with respect to some other stars who are anyway not fixed there is no such thing as fixed stars so for example earth is not an inertial frame because earth is spinning earth is also going about sun it's not an inertial frame the sun is going about the center of the galaxy now we know in hindsight our galaxies form a cluster and there is a supercluster and they are all in motion 
So there is no such thing as fixed star. If that is the argument that we take, then you know this argument of Berkeley and Leibniz. It sounds more uh, interesting and physical that there is no such thing as you know absolute motion. That all motions are relative, because how does the bucket know about that it should spin? How does the water in the bucket know that it should spin with respect to the fixed stars? So to counter argue this, you know, for example, Newton said that uh, okay, you know, uh, he knows that acceleration is there for sure because if you take a rubber sphere and give it a spin, it would bulge at the equator. But now, what you know, what these people said that if the absolute, if all motions are absolutely relative, okay, then there is no way for us to know that you know if the bucket was held fixed and if the fixed stars are rotated, then what will be the situation? So if you take that the all motion is relative, then the same result should follow. And this is called the Marx principle. Marx principle says that the local inertial properties of bodies they depend upon the distribution of matter at the large scale in universe. Okay. So uh, uh, Marx actually very beautifully uh, had discussed these issues in his uh, famous book Science of Mechanics. He was a very fierce critic of that. You know, you cannot take absolute space as reference. Nor are fixed stars. And once you take fixed stars, then you cannot define one reference frame with respect to some other matter which is not necessarily fixed. Uh, now it turns out that this Marx principle. So actually, you know, by the way, so this Marx principle is a very shady thing. I mean, not shady. I'm saying it's a very. It's there is no concrete principle or definition of the Marx principle. It's actually a whole complex of ideas. Okay. That is, but which all roughly have a common theme that the local inertial. So the, it's a. It's a statement about the origin of inertia. What is the origin of inertial force? Why is it that bodies resist spontaneous changes? What is the origin of inertial mass? Okay. Newton does not provide any explanation for this, and Mach found this unphysical. So he felt that the you know the Inertial attributes have their origin on the distribution of matter at far off places. Now, uh, maybe actually, you know, it does. Uh, I have to stop right now because I have to take uh, my kids somewhere. But uh, this argument, what I want to drive home is that this argument is not pure metaphysics. There are concrete consequences whether the Marx principle is true or not. There are physical consequences whether the Marx principle is true or not. For instance. If the inertial mass is a function of the distribution of you know matter, then of course it matters. Uh, you know if the uh, then the inertia will have anisotropy depending upon the distribution of mass. Okay, and there will be contributions to. So the whole idea is that if you uh, okay, let me. Uh, I don't know, Shinjul. Uh, have you come across this equation before? That if you formulate your second law in a non-inertial frame, I'm asking Shinjul because the other people it seems are all from physics backgrounds, of course. That if you formulate your second law in a non-inertial frame with acceleration a. Okay. Then the second law. This can be stored in a very straightforward way. Then the second law takes the form. Okay. F real minus. Suppose you are interested in the motion of a body of mass m. And its acceleration in the prime, I mean, non inertial frame is a prime. Okay. Then the second law applied to the non inertial frame 
here i am talking about a linear acceleration okay this a can also be rotational acceleration just that the form is slightly more complicated for rotational acceleration that is the okay so this is the form of the second law so basically this is the this is what is known as actually you know i think all this is a material for a much more than it can be covered in one lecture uh so it is called a fictitious force because you know in second law you have a real force related to the real acceleration okay but in the non inertial frame the acceleration gets a contribution not just from all the real forces but it has a contribution of m times the acceleration of the frame and it is called fictitious because you will have no such term if you formulate your problem in the inertial frame okay so the whole idea is that what is the origin of this term so if marx idea is true then this term should be calculable in terms of the distribution of the matter of the whole you know so if the bucket is rotating with say omega with respect to the rest of the universe okay then according to the marx principle the if you stop the bucket and suppose if you have a means to rotate the entire universe the same bulging of water should follow okay so the whole idea is can we obtain the form of this term you know can we explain this additional contribution coming from the rotation of the frame from the rest of the universe so it turns out that actually you can obtain such a term i mean there is a calculation i'll just give you the you know uh okay so it turns out that one can in a straight forward way show using an analogy from electrodynamics you know one can find you know what is the field due to an accelerating charge okay and from that q one can write the uh, you know force of gravity due to an accelerating mass which will have a this form now this will be equal to you know ma if g m m sorry uh gm by c squared r is of order 1 okay and it turns out that you know actually uh, some calculation suggests that this quantity is actually of order 10 which is not very far from 1 so it's tantalizingly close uh but Uh, i think i will stop this discussion here because i think if one wants to go further here then uh, it's actually quite intricate and i won't be able to and honestly you know um i myself do not fully understand the issues here uh, but it turns out that uh, if one goes by what weinberg says the the answer to the you know whether the newton was right or mark was right is somewhere between newton and mark mark okay so i'll I, this is nicely discussed so by the way you know if one wants but is interested in the marx principle then it's nicely discussed in the uh there is some preliminary discussion in the newtonian mechanics by ap french there's a very beautiful discussion on this uh, by gravitation and uh, uh principles of gravitation and cosmology uh cosmology and gravitation by michael berry the beautiful book and uh, very accessible to undergraduates uh and of course uh, weinberg has a nice discussion on this and uh, a very critical and rigorous discussion on newton's laws is also there in the max bonds beautiful book on einstein's theory of relativity very insightful discussion uh and of course you know newton uh, of course clapner is uh, also a very insightful book to understand the issues uh, 
there is a beautiful book uh, lectures on classical mechanics by ak rai choudhury i think it's okay. even out of AK out of Rai-Chaudhry. yeah it also has okay. it also has a nice uh, discussion on the newton's laws uh, critical appraisal of the i mean critical discussion on the newton's laws um uh, these are some references uh, which uh, uh, i mean if there are somebody who are undergraduates who might find it useful i think um, nice. i think i'm sorry actually it's uh, i couldn't really uh, very coherently uh, put it i think i perhaps you know digressed a lot but uh, but i just wanted to you know drive home the point that there are lot of issues here and uh, you know it's not is one thing to apply the newton's laws but when one starts asking questions in fact let me tell you that you know i think i could only cover you know 10 uh, 20% of what i wanted to really go into uh, uh, but yeah anyway um, i think i prefer the blackboard but this is not actually very and i mean i have to look here and write here you know and i had to change my laptop in fact i had to install a new software and there were issues with that because my linux partition developed problems i am in windows right now and uh, my incidentally my old vacuum tablet also developed some issues all problems happened so i had a new laptop uh, uska pen is uh, it had a lot of friction i didn't know how to change that friction you know i was not able to so my handwritings were badly decipherable <laughs> No, no. I think no. it was all visible. No problem with that. And I think the discussion is interesting. In fact, like I was wondering, maybe we should come back to this last topic that you are trying to bring up. Mm-hmm. We should probably continue either next week or we. Yeah, can you can continue next week, week if you want. Yeah, like, like this is this is supposed to be like that. Like we take we take like Newton's laws to be the completely like as a uh, what you call. Uh, Absolutely right, Newton's laws are here. That's it. <laughs> and yeah, yeah. with them. Yeah. But I think this is this is something interesting. Yeah. Uh, the last thing that you were bringing it up, but it is probably a little too late to continue on that. So maybe yeah, yeah. next week or week or two or whatever. Would you like to continue next week? Ah, uh, yeah. Actually, okay. Ah, uh, I think in principle, yes. I really would like to do that. But uh, another thing that I want to weigh in is, uh, you know, I. <laughs> committed myself to teaching a course next semester uh, which i have absolutely uh, no clue about uh, differential geometry okay i wanted to learn and i thought that let me learn and uh, if i commit myself then i'll be compelled to teach it uh, uh, but it was as i started to learn it i found it to be a rabbit hole and uh, i think bahut tel nikal raha hai i mean it's <laughs> so i'm struggling very hard so i'm completely right now I'll, let me i think um, i'll maybe i'll try and get up but i'm right now completely you know occupied by that because i have to teach it next semester and i want to bring it to a stage where uh, it is uh, lectureable because i want to build it on this whole manifold theory and uh, this classical differential geometry is fine but when you want to really do it for the way uh, bernard shoes does it in that uh, geometrical methods in mathematical physics uh, i found it actually quite uphill this whole differential geometry uh, when you really want to understand it from the mathematics perspective to bring in topology and manifolds and all that so it's very yeah. time consuming idea yeah yeah so it's uh... oh so this will be a two semester one semester so this is Uh, going to be in the fall semester, correct? No, this As is going to be the summer. August, this August. So I don't have August, much time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, it's yeah. like, like no, I'm really starting from scratch. I mean, I really have. Uh, oh, that's that's a lot. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. 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 So, what all do you plan to cover? Yeah, I'm essentially planning to, you know, okay, uh, the the basics of uh, differential forms. Uh, Developed on manifolds, and uh, if one can develop the classical mechanics, the Lagrangian mechanics, and the uh, the, the basically various uh, vector calculus and the theorems of vector calculus uh, in the language of forms, and electrodynamics in the language of forms, and maybe some cohomology, uh, 
differential cohomology uh, and Lie groups in the language of forms, differential geometry. Wow. Okay. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. So can can I cast all these classical physics in the language of forms? You know. Got it. Got it, got it. Classical mechanics and electrodynamics. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Nice. And of nice. course, the associated symmetries, you know, group theory, little bit of group theory and the Lie groups uh, and the theory of uh, uh, cohomology. By the way, there's this nice book by, you know, uh, John Bais, uh, Gage Fields, uh, Knots, and Gravity. So, okay. Yeah, it, it, it has a very, very nice and a very accessible, accessible yet, of course, you know, accessible, as accessible uh, differential geometry can get. You know? <laughs> uh, but uh, it was a, it's a very nice, uh, you know, so it, he develops very nicely. There's a, uh, a two, three chapters, very detailed uh, chapters. Uh, it's not uh, perfectly rigorous from the absolutely mathematical perspective. But it's still as mathematical as it can get for us physicists. And of course, this book by Schutz, Bernard Schutz, mm. is nice. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there, are, there is this uh, new book which has come by Nidam, Visual Differential Geometry. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Nidam, nice, Nidam, Nidam. So there is a nice book by Nidam on the complex analysis, visual complex analysis. Yeah. Which is uh, very deep actually. I, I just bought the complex analysis and differential geometry, but uh, I've heard a good praise for Nidam's book. But then again, that's not the route that I'm planning to take. Actually, all this visual uh, things are fine when you understood things, but not to begin with. <laughs> got it. Got it, got it. Yeah, so then you should be concentrating on that, I guess, uh, right? Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, it's just that I want to organize, if I want to give this, I want to organize it better. No, no, you should, I, I understand. But I want to, Perfect. yeah, for example, I mean, today I just gave this, but I don't think I could organize it, you know. Uh, uh, this particularly, if it was a blackboard, I would have been much more comfortable. Writing here is little, uh, looking at this and writing here is, I find it challenging. Yeah, I noticed. Yeah, mm -hmm. but it came out well, uh, like on our end. Yeah. Okay. So that you might not be satisfied. That's different. Mm -hmm. so at least I hope there were some takeaways. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. 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 Nice. That was really uh, nice uh, discussion, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. So so uh, if there are any questions, uh, quick questions, I can because I think I haven't asked anybody if there are any quick questions, you know. Oh, yeah, Shinju. Yeah, we have Shinju and Linu Kumar here other than Pachi and me. So we have four people. I don't know whether you can see all your all the participants all the time or not. So uh, yeah. that's it. Uh, yeah. Like we started with about uh, like four more participants, but then Slowly, they yeah. Uh, long long was. No, I think in part, I think it was. I wouldn't really put it uh, coherently, you know. I think <laughs> so. I, yeah. I, I mean, I got distracted a little bit at the end, but I think I followed most of it, and uh, I think I, I appreciated. I think that's what was needed. Yeah, I did. Mm -hmm. Oh, that was nice. Good. Any questions? I mean, or, yeah, I mean, hopefully, like, you will come back and maybe <laughs> go further with this argument that you were building up towards the end. Because that is, that was like a really interesting for me, at least. I was trying to yeah. follow it, but yeah, look it up also. Nice. I think I didn't uh, worry too much about maps principles so much, never read that much either. So I, have, I don't understand it honestly very well. No, no, so, I mean, honestly, yeah. I mean, Marx principle is, uh, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, I definitely don't understand. Uh, mm -hmm. so, but there must be something interesting in it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, it's definitely, see, 
um, uh, I've generally taken, I mean, see, for example, uh, uh, in physics community, people take a stand uh, about, uh, they take a practical stand. For example, let me just, you know, share one ex ex experience. Um, I'm trying to introduce a course on foundations of quantum mechanics. Okay. And elective. Uh, now, for my foundations, you know, I want to capture this uh, Bohr Einstein debate and this whole uh, attitude of David Bohm uh, on uh, how to develop quantum mechanics, the interpretational issues and aspects. Um, and there were, uh, of course, uh, uh, aspects experiment and John Bell's results and all those things will be a part of it. But there are a multitude of perspectives on interpretational aspects of quantum mechanics, right? And students read up things uh, on the net here and there, and they gain a half-baked knowledge. So I thought that, you know, why not devise a course which captures all of this so that they get at least, you know, a fairly authentic perspective on who said what and where do we stand? And I felt that, you know, I think uh, I myself don't understand these things issues fully well. And I think when we don't understand it, it is very important to go through it very rigorously and critically before writing anything off. But unfortunately, you know, I think uh, our people in uh, Goa campus uh, tend to think that, you know, so I mean, they have an aversion for some philosophical words. When you use the word ontology and all that. Now, you see, uh, I'm not for, you know, nonsense. I'm not for scrap and all that. Uh, but Philosophy is not nonsense and uh, interpretational questions are not nonsense. It is important to be able to do calculations and um, earn your bread and butter, right? But unless and until you can write things off with conclusion, you cannot say that just because there are some philosophical jargons and all that, these things are, you know, we should not teach these things to students. Um, physics is actually a sub-branch of philosophy. Philosophy is not nonsense. You know, it asks genuine questions and it's a genuine branch of knowledge and interpretational issues are important. And see, my point is that uh, I, I just explained to you my philosophy of crutch, right? Sometimes you take up some questions. They may not, I mean, your gut might say that these questions are not right. But when you pursue them through them, you refine and you come to right questions, right? Right questions are actually Organic is an organic outgrowth of pursuing what you really want to understand. You cannot start off by asking right questions. They are an organic outgrowth of what you pose to understand. And I think if uh, somebody like David Bohm thought that these are important, if Einstein thought that this is important, if John Archibald Wheeler thought that these are important issues, Weinberg thinks that these are important issues, and <laughs> We think that, okay, we should not teach our students this. This is nonsense. So uh, it's quite kind of. <laughs> so Marx I principle uh, is also like, you know, I'm saying that a lot of people think that, okay, they should not worry. Now, it was Marx principle, which got Einstein to worry about gravity and about the, okay. So he started, he was a strong proponent and believer of Marx principle. And he wanted GTR to be a Machian theory. Later on, it, it turned out that he didn't believe that he, he felt that he has failed in realizing his Machian dream, that GTR is not truly Machian. Okay. But that does not take away the importance of the influence that Marx ideas had. And so mm -hmm. I'm saying that there is something called a crutch, which you can throw later on. But like a pole Walters pole, it helps you scale higher and see what you cannot see from a lower height. <laughs> so yeah, that's the attitude yeah. I'm, I'm trying to take. You know, I mean, I'm neither a pro mark theory nor anti mark theory because I don't understand. <laughs> I guess that is quite relevant because like we uh, probably uh, end up hiding away so much of stuff in the, uh, what do you call, normal curriculum that the whole, uh, what you call the thinking process about the subject itself, like the science itself is totally gone. It like just totally become mechanical. Exactly. The teaching becomes mechanical, the learning becomes mechanical. And there is like, because 
we don't we just completely take away what is uh, what could raise the questions exactly right? so yeah i think this is very um a very and, relevant point. And if you look at the history of physics, you know, all stalwarts who have made non-trivial contributions, they have all been strong philosophers. You know, they had an attitude and a viewpoint. I think viewpoints are important. Opinions are important. Attitude is important, I think. You know, because it, it is attitude. And, you know, for example, Hawking and Penrose, they differ on very fundamental issues in quantum gravity. But it is what makes Hawking, Hawking and Penrose, Penrose. You don't have to agree to either of them. But that does not take away the character that they have and that they, they owe their character to the attitude that they have. Right? Bohr and Einstein. It's not about who is right, who is wrong. It's about that they had a conviction. And that they were both, see, I think all good physicists are good philosophers to begin with because they have a viewpoint, they have a perspective, they have a, they have a gut feeling about, you know, what is the right approach? It's not logical always. It, I mean, if it is logical, then it is finished. You connect dots backwards, right? True. True, true. It's quite right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think I'll stop here. And, uh, yeah, I think it's, we it should. Thanks, Rishi. But this was nice. Very yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. At least I will go, I'm going to be learning a little bit about Max's principle after this. Yeah. <laughs> Not too much, but at least get the gist of it. Yeah. So by the way, you know, here, I, I know just one point I wanted to make, that this distinction between the inertial mass and gravitational mass, there is also a much finer distinction which is not normally discussed. Yeah, there, yeah. Are two, there are two kinds of gravitational mass, active oh. and passive. Oh. And their equality, yes, their equality is a consequence of the third law. <laughs> okay. <laughs> They're not a priori supposed to be equal. And yeah, their yeah. equality is a consequence of the third law. So what I'm trying to say is that when you take it apart and look at it in a piece by piece, then you look at the connections that, you know, okay, what connects where and, you know, what is independent, what is redundant, what is relevant and, you know, what is the platform and what is the thing that you put on the platform the relations of different things, you know. Oh, oh. Yeah. Yeah, let's yeah, yeah, wind let's it stop. up here. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So this, uh, yeah, so we'll keep continuing this discussion. Yeah, I think yeah. these things don't get over. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. And yeah, I don't like to put deadlines like these things should go in a free sense, I think. Yeah. Like we should keep continuing. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thanks to you guys for this wonderful platform. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks. I mean, I'm enjoying it. <laughs> so yeah. yes, 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 like yes, yes. every talk there is something new that pops up. So yeah, yeah, yes. Same here. So okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Bye. Okay. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye.